So, Nick Simonek, uh, welcome again uh, to Astro Talk UK. I think as one of the UK's leading astrophotographers, uh, you have a particular insight because you've been doing it for such a long time. And I, I'm sure you've seen such a, um, a transformation over those years. So I want to start off asking you, Nick, um, how has the hobby of astro uh, amateur astronomy, bigger picture of uh, amateur astronomy rather than just astrophotography, changed, do you think, over the last four decades that you've been actively involved? It's been an unbelievable change. And it's been so exciting to be part of it and to see these things changing in real time effectively. Of course, back in the 80s, um, the vast majority of people were using film. Uh, you know, a lot of us had our own little um, dark room in the bathroom where we'd set up and you know shoot black and white images of whatever was in the sky and then process the film ourselves. And you know, look back on some of those and you think, okay. But yeah, it, that made it difficult. Um, you know, film is great when you're working from a really dark location but when you're working in town or uh, you know in, in a less uh, perfect location film is a very difficult medium to use so you can sort of think of that as the 80s and alongside that the choice of equipment that was available was hugely limited we did have schmidt cassegrain telescopes from the likes of mead and celestron but you know they were quite expensive and there weren't many locations that that sold them but they were there if you were prepared to pay. So a lot of people built their own equipment, um, you know, mirrors uh, in telescopes, um, drive systems, even from the old barn door mounts that people used to build just to get some form of tracking. So that kind of encompassed the 80s. Now, at the end of the 80s, I think one of the, the biggest changes for me was the introduction of the first auto guider, which was a CCD camera with a tiny chip, and it was designed to be used to um, guide your driven telescope without too much input from you know, the mere human, shall we say. And um, they, they work really well. They, they were a kind of hybrid between um, CCDs used for guiding and film for actually photographing. Now, there were two of those that became available at the end of the, the 80s and the early 90s. And of course, from that point onwards, then the CCD cameras started to appear. Now, in their earliest incarnations, they were fairly basic. But for us, uh, you know, people who have been struggling with film for, for you know, the best part of a decade, I suppose, it was um, an unbelievable, sort of rev you know, it was the CCD revolution. So the 90s um, were, were sort of populated by gradually improving cameras from people like the Santa Barbara Instruments Group, or SBIG, as they were then, and um, we were seeing slightly larger sensors becoming available. Um, and the, the, the sensitivity of these cameras um, really was you know, unbelievable compared to the, the relative sensitivity of film. And without sounding too nerdy, shall we say, um, we, we measure the, the, the performance of a detector or film in terms of its so-called quantum efficiency. And basically, um, the higher the quantum efficiency, uh, the more sensitive the, the device is. And, you know, we were working with cameras that had about 60 or 70 percent quantum efficiency, which means 60 or 70 percent of the incoming light was recorded as a usable signal. If you compare that to film, which had a, a quantum efficiency of about two or three percent, which drained off as during the exposure, it shows you just what a revolution these um, CCD cameras. And alongside that, because people wanted to do color work, was the um, the appearance of high quality filters, not not the sort of um, photographic gel gelatin gel, gel filters that that you know use for daytime photography, but these were kind of very very sort of specific and sort of high technology filters to allow you to do color work. And of course, again, alongside that, we needed programs like in the early days Adobe Photoshop. Um, which was, I think, the first of the, the bigger programs that, that allowed us to, to take those three black and white images that have been shot between with filters to produce a colour image. And that's the technique we still use to this day. So we were seeing uh, an improvement in, uh, in software as well as the hardware. So as the 90s progressed, we started to see things like adaptive optics, which was a very high speed tip tilt mirror system that went between the telescope and the, the CCD camera. 
which was supposed to cancel out um, seeing effects. And it really, should be just these are just high speed auto guiders, but they did give you um, a good result, providing you were prepared to sort of pay and learn how to use these systems. So this all happened within in within the nineties. Now, remember this, although I called it the CCD revolution, um, what was yet to come was the DSLR revolution. <laughs> so again, it's a kind of not, not quite a spin off because the, the sensor technology is quite, quite different. But we, in the, I think in the early, or well, perhaps late 1990s, the early 2000s, we started to see these reasonably good quality DSLR cameras, which proved to be eminently suitable, particularly for wide field imaging of things like the Milky Way, and you know things that have the you know scenery in the foreground, um, you know these really sort of lovely shots that you, you can see, which film really could never compete with. And I, I strongly remember taking my first DSLR to La Palma, where the skies were dark, and taking just something like a five-second exposure, and the frame was just full of stars, which you couldn't see with the naked eye at all, and it was like wow you know this is incredible so you know that was good and of course as the 2000s went you know continue to sort of uh, run through we, we got better and better dslr cam the full frame sensors so you know sensors that were the same size as a piece of 35 mil film um you know less noise higher sensitivity you know that that's something that's going on to this day now the, the for the last decade um I think for me, the biggest change is, and this is something I never thought I would talk about or see even, and that's the demise of the CCD sensor. Hmm. Um, you know, the professional astronomers um, hosting sites abroad, so remote observatories around the world, they're all using um, CCD technology. As I am here, I've got two cameras in my, in my, using my back garden observatory. I grew up with CCDs, I've seen them evolve. And you know, I think it's a it's a fantastic technology, but unfortunately, well, maybe that's a relative term, but mm -hmm. um, unfortunately for the, the CCD manufacturers, at least, um, the, the the CCD camera is is disappearing, and um, the, what's happened is there's been a shift over to CMOS technology, and, and CMOS technology is um, what is the kind of technology you get in your camera phone. Um, a phone camera, I should say, and um, you know, sorts of all other imaging, um, you know, video cameras, this kind of stuff. And now, um, CC, oh, sorry, CCD, CMOS cameras, I should say. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and the reason for that, I think, predominantly is that it's much cheaper to produce CMOS sensors in, in, in bulk mm. um, compared to the CCD cameras. So, if you, um, for example, look uh, online or in the gallery pages of any astronomical magazine, you'll see that virtually all uh, all images that have been sent in are wow. taken using CMOS cameras um, from you know Chinese manufacturers. Now, it, it's a good thing um, in that they're spectacularly good now compared to just maybe three or four years ago in terms of the quantum efficiency, which I talked about earlier on. Mm -hmm. um, they're up in the ninety percent now, which is you know incredible. Low noise. Um, How does that compare with the quantum efficiency of current CCDs? Well, they, they vary. The ones I'm using at home are typically about 65%, something oh. like that. Of course, it does vary in which yeah, wavelength sure. that you're actually imaging in as well. So they're going to be cheaper, they're cheaper to produce, and they're better. Uh, and that's why you're seeing this potential demise of CCDs. Yeah. I mean, basically, I think what's what's happening, uh, if I sort of just very briefly explain, if I was taking an image from my back garden, mm -hmm. I'd go out there with a black and white camera with three filters, and I'd spend four hours imaging through one filter, four hours imaging through the next filter, and four, four you know, approximately four hours per filter. Now, that's assuming I've got a nice 12 hour night clear night, which, of course, never happens. <laughs> so that that 12 hours worth of data may be spread over days, weeks, mm -hmm. even months and right. realistically even years, because you might find that if you have a big run of cloudy nights, uh -huh. the object you've been imaging has disappeared. It's, it's set. So you have to wait till the next year to get it. Now, that's how we've always worked. And, you know, that's absolutely fine. But with CMOS cameras, what a lot of people are doing, they're buying color cameras. So what we call them one shot color cameras. So there's no specific need for color filters to produce color images. You could attach those cameras directly to your telescope and, you know, within a certain amount of time, get a color image. 
but we can also get um, specialized filters that are designed to work with color cameras and they're, they're known as dual band or tri band filters but basically they're narrow band filters so what, what this gives you is a chance to take pictures um, that show these objects in a completely different view the, the, the narrow band view which is absolutely great it's much better than the broadband view but they can do it much quicker where these cameras are so sensitive so if you're a person you know with a young family and a, 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 a you know a tiring job and all this kind of thing you know a, a, a color camera with yeah. a CMOS sensor and mm. one of these filters allows you to go out for two or three hours a night and get a really good image and I think you know this appeals to people mm. um you know if you that and that's where we would be likely to be headed it's really fascinating you've covered a lot of quite rightly uh time in that uh, uh, previous answer because I remember in the early 80s when CCDs first came out, they were just about available for the amateur community. And I then remember uh, coming across the concept of adaptive uh, optics. And to hear you speak about that now in the context of an amateur astronomer, mm -hmm. it's just a huge leap. I, I really have to um, do a double take on that. And it's the sort of thing that, you know, somebody who's like 25 or sort of in their 20s and uh, up to 30, they will not be aware of the kind of dramatic changes that have taken place. And adaptive optics is another one. And going right back to the beginning, you were talking about dark rooms. I'm sure there can be many youngsters who have no idea what a dark room is. Oh. I remember seeing a lovely um, video on, on YouTube about these youngsters who was looking at um, a telephone, the old rotary type telephone, it's ringing. And they're not quite sure how to operate it. Mm. And and I thought it was a joke or something, but it's actually, you know, it, it's quite true that uh, we, um, I, I remember growing up with something, one of the words that came to mind when you talk about uh, dark rooms and uh, film was reciprocity failure. Right, now, yeah. Nobody would recognize that these days. It's a fascinating, quick view, look back over the last four decades. Thanks very much for that. So that's um, a focus specifically on how the whole um, hobbies changed. And you've already highlighted um, the uh, kind of, uh, some of the tech, uh, technology that we can use. In terms of visual observing now, because of those narrow filters and the CCDs, um, do you think um, visually, uh, are there many people who visually observe just do drawings as they used to in the past? Do you come across that kind of observation? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do. I have friends who, who um, you know, are willing to set aside time to visually observe the sky. And that's, you know, mm -hmm. that's something, yeah. I, you know, I really do understand. But, you know, in, in this sort of modern day when, you know, the light pollution is getting worse, mm -hmm. um, I think people tire of the idea of sort of taking a telescope out there and, and looking at, you know, something like the Andromeda Galaxy, and it's just a tiny little sort of fuzzy blob. You know, conceptually, it's an amazing thing. We won't take anything away from that at all. The idea of you actually using your own eye to look at these things. Um, but I think once you've done that for a year or two, you either become put off and just move into another hobby, or you say, well, I want to take this further now and go for, a, you know, a driven mount and a cameras and stuff like that. So people are still doing it. And I know people who are doing both quite happily. They'll be imaging, but they have a separate yeah. telescope just when the night's clear to go out and look at the moon. In fact, Ian King, you know, he doesn't have an observatory at home now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got um, an observatory abroad in Spain, but he, he's quite happy to go out with long focus refractors and look at the moon and the planets and stuff like that. So there are, you know, people are quite happy to do that, but I think there's probably less now than there were um, in yeah. the past. Uh, and now you mentioned um, a remote observatory. So let me talk to you about that. Uh, I know this isn't new, been around in one form or another for about a couple of decades now, but uh, is that where you see the, perhaps the, I can call it that, uh, the next revolution in amateur astronomy, people making use of uh, robotic telescopes. So if you just start off with a, <clears throat> with a very simple definition and how amateurs are already using this and perhaps others can use this, what is a robotic telescope? Well, first and foremost, just before I get into that, you're absolutely right to use that term revolution, 
Uh, I've talked about the revolutions over the, the decades in terms of the censors and things, but I think you're absolutely right to describe it like that because I think things are, are changing oh. in the direction. Now, the idea, of course, of a remote observatory is that you can have equipment based at a location abroad um, in, in a site that gives you much clearer sky, so less problems with light pollution. You know, there might be a mountain top site or something like that, and hopefully a higher proportion of clear nights better seeing, so this is the steadiness of the atmosphere. Um, if you have a geographic location that's conducive to that, um, mm -hmm. you have better results. And the idea is that rather than going to these locations, you um, actually, because you know, they're spread all over the world. And that in itself is an advantage because for example, if you have a remote observatory in Australia or Chile or something like that, which I'll talk about later on, um, it gives you access to the southern sky. Uh, the objects that we can't see here in the UK and you know that that's an amazing thing but the idea is you you have this equipment abroad and you control it in some cases just via the internet so if you set up your own equipment at one of these uh, remote observatories you're controlling everything over the internet and the best way to work like this is to actually have software which is scripted so you can set up a whole night's observing in advance and hit the go button effectively. And then you get up the next morning and you go and look and all your data have been saved onto a, the computer hard drive, which is downloaded, then you process the image. And of course you've got this advantage of you know, lots of longer sort of clear nights, longer clear spells, maybe these exotic objects. But um, you know, there's that, that, I think that is the way things are going because what's happening on many more of these remote location observatories and these fantastic locations are appearing now so it's a natural progression. You know, that doesn't stop you in any way, shape or form. Like, you know, people like myself have a good, well-equipped back garden observatory, but it just kind of, it's the next step now where you can go to these places, or sorry, you can, um, you, know, you can have equipment in these places and get far better results than you can from your observatory at home and, you know, on newer objects as well. So in addition to, um, um investing and having your own remote observatory you can rent them these days as well is that right yeah, absolutely right yeah there's, there's there's a there's two major choices if you decide to go down the remote observing route there are two choices and both have their pluses and minuses now first and foremost as i just talked about if you um invest in high quality equipment because it has to be good equipment if you're going to send it to the one of these sites you want something that's going to be reliable every night and of course there is a, a cost associated with that uh, you know that cost may be 10 or 12 thousand pounds so it's a serious investment but of course the advantage is it's your equipment you can use it as you know every second the nights are clear you can use your own equipment then you're going to get a good return on it now a lot of people are put off by the complexity of that and the cost so the alternative is to rent time on these telescopes and that's a very nice thing to do to be fair, it can be expensive if you're booking a lot of time on you know, premium telescopes in, in very good sites, it, it can rapidly become very expensive. But of course, that, you know, that's a manageable fee. And uh, you, know, you, you haven't got this huge sort of initial outlay and you've got no worries about equipment problems. It's all dealt with by the people who are observe, uh, you know, setting up these, these remote observatories. So yeah, you might, might be happy to just book several hours um, on a telescope once a month or something like that and you know, give you access to the these exotic locations exotic objects in the sky and uh, of course you know the, the price is very if you're just using small telescopes and the important thing to remember as well and this became very apparent to me quite recently is that when you're working on a high altitude from, from a high altitude site with premium equipment supplied by these people. Mm -hmm. um, here, when I'm working from home, I might spend 12 hours over the course of a week or something imaging a particular target. But from these real high quality sites, you can get fantastic results, particularly on the brighter objects, within just an hour or something like mm -hmm. that. So, you know, you don't have to book these great big long extended sessions. So yeah, for a lot of people, um, you know, that, that will work and I think many more people as more and more of these remote sites are appearing more and more active images are going over there um you know, going over to, to using these and um you know, getting really really nice results so can you give us an example of uh, uh let's say something above 10 inch diameter aperture optical telescope somewhere in maybe even the sun hemisphere uh sort of almost professional uh type setting for an hour 
how much would that cost and which kind of uh, companies are you familiar with? Well, the one I'm sort of intimately familiar with is a company called Telescope Live, uh -huh. who um, were um, initially, the, the way I got to meet them was they had a, a display at the London Astro Fest. Oh, yeah. Um, a couple of years back and I, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they said they'd like to talk to me and um, I went and spoke to them really nice people and um, they asked me to become a sort of collaborator with them they knew of a long-term imager and they asked me if I'd like to use their telescopes and um, I was you know it, it was a great thing because they've got three observatories one in Spain where I have my own sort of remote observatory with my friend Ian King it's the same location one in Australia um, but the sort of flagship is the, is the observatory they have in Chile. And of course, with Australia and Chile, you get access to the deep southern sky. Mm. So um, for the last 18 months or so, I've been using their telescopes um, regularly. Um, the results are just amazing. But if you buy time on their big telescopes, mm -hmm. it can work out to something like a pound a minute, something like that. Right. Um, so, you know, not insubstantial. But they they evolved in in a sense where rather than just booking a block of time on one of their telescopes they have a system called one click observations where they have templates for all these different objects in the sky and if you subscribe to one of their three monthly plans you mm -hmm. get more you know, the more expensive ones give you almost unlimited access to these one click observations so you literally mm -hmm. if there was something like say the android or let's say something a bit more exotic the eta carina nebula which we can't see from the uk if that is available as a one click, you literally just click on it and then forget it. And then at some point over the next days or weeks, you'll be notified that the images have been taken. You can download the data and, and process it. And that works out a lot cheaper. So you're not actually choosing a particular right. time. You're not booking time on the telescope, which I had done with them. It's hugely enjoyable. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, for most people, it, it, it's a, anybody can do this, even people who aren't images. But the website's very easy to use and you can just click on it and at some point over the next days or weeks the data will come down and again because these objects are bright and it's in prime locations um you know even just an hour's worth of imaging um will give you sort of great results that, that's um thanks for that background and it really is quite enticing uh I, I think even for those of us who may not want to do this on a long-term basis uh, i'm just so curious about this i'll have a go just just to see how it works out but let me ask you i know um in the amateur radio community uh, ever since the advent of um digital modes which can use the internet um a lot of amateur radio enthusiasts think ah if you're using the internet that not really amateur radio you, you need to faff around with the antenna go through all the crazy signal processing and it's Amateur observing uh, is a hobby, losing something. If you really do literally use this one click option on a remote telescope, is that the same thing? It's, it's a very good point. And, you know, I talk to people a lot about this. A lot of people mm -hmm. say, I'm not interested because, you know, I want to go out with my own equipment, set it up, and, you know, do my own thing. And there's a huge amount of satisfaction with that. And I really do get that. But it's not an either or situation. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you can yeah. do both. You can, uh, you can, I dare say, you can struggle away from your sort of light polluted back on with equipment and stuff like that. And, you know, it's all part of the fun. You're connecting mm. to the sky using yeah. your own equipment. But, you know, it's just an alternative for people yeah. who don't want to do that. There's a very easy way of getting high quality data and they can practice all their processing skills and produce a print and say, look, you know, I've, I've done this sort of. Um, so to me, I don't think it's an either or situation. It's it's uh, uh, you know it's something you can do if you want to. If you don't, that's fine. But for me, I love it because yeah. I just love getting raw data and thinking I can put my own sort of personal stamp on this. And it's mm. something I've been saying for decades when I've been doing my talks to astron astronomical societies is that mm -hmm. I could go to the society with a load of um, <coughs> you know data sticks or something with raw data, and I could give it to every member in the audience. And say let's come back next week and we'll all have a look at how we process these images and every one of them will be different mm -hmm. so by virtue of that you can put your own stamp on this raw data which i absolutely love doing you know with all the new software that's coming out yeah. you can ink so much more sort of resolution out of these images and you know i think the last time we spoke i, I may have said something similar in that 
the results that we're getting routinely either from our back garden observatories in light polluted locations mm -hmm. but certainly from the ones abroad um, we're matching the the results that professional astronomers were getting you know 20 or 30 years ago using um, you know fairly small refractors and things like that I think that's a key takeaway. It's not either or. And uh, even for those who may choose not to do that, I'm sure they'll be curious like me to at least have a go. So I'll have a look at uh, Telescopes Live. And uh, well, The good thing uh, about that as well, they, you get a, a free month uh, trial. You don't have to put any credit card details. You can oh, I see. And, right. and, um, yeah, if you decide to do that and you need help with anything on that, just let me know. I've, I've been using it for um, you know, a long time. So. Will do. Thank you. And now, if I can take you back to remote telescopes, you were telling me last time um, when we last spoke about 10 years ago that you were going to be uh, developing something in that uh, space. You have now got a remote telescope. Just tell us the outline the journey that you've gone through on um, establishing your own remote observatory. What is it? And what kind of things you do with it? Yeah, it's, it's been interesting. I mean, the, the first, first and foremost, the idea was to have our own equipment in a prime location in Spain. And uh, that's what we did. We, we invested in equipment. I did this with my friend Ian King to sort of halve the costs effectively. Because the other mm -hmm. thing to consider, even the outlay for the equipment, which is, you know, can, can be quite high, there's also the fact that you have to pay a monthly hosting charge for that equipment. Mm -hmm. And um, again, that might be something like, 200 pounds a month or something like that. So, you know, again, not insubstantial. But we decided to go down that route because the, the advantage of having your own equipment there is you can use it non-stop. If the sky is clear, you've got access to your equipment. You're not, not um, in competition with other people vying for time on the telescope. And uh, we, our first sight was very good. We got some absolutely great results there, but we found because of the high altitude, mm -hmm. a lot of the winter time was, there were problems with snow, um, and ice and fog and stuff like that. And, you know, it can affect the roofs opening and all this kind of thing. So we then moved to a second location hosted by um, a person called Colin Cooper, who, who was an expat in Spain. He set up a, a remote observatory in his, in his garden, effectively. Very, very good job. But the sky there wasn't as good as it could have been. So Colin decided to move, uh, and Ian King was also a partner with him in, in, the, in the business. And they, they moved to a much darker site near the Calar Alto, Calar Alto Observatory in Spain. So very, very high quality skies. And that's where we are at the moment. I talked about the high-end equipment and, you know, we have had a few issues with equipment because, it, again, it's very difficult to troubleshoot over the internet. But um, fortunately, you know, there will be people on site to, to resolve these issues. But, you know, it can be a little bit frustrating. But we're getting good, good quality data now. So, mm -hmm. and, and the other thing to bear in mind is that when you're working over the internet you know there may be significant lags and things like that mm -hmm. so it's if you're going down that route it's a good idea to use um software something like sequence generator pro which is a very popular software package that allows you to script a whole night's observing in one go so you tell the telescope to do this with these filters these exposure times all the mm -hmm. calibration frames and everything off it goes and then you sort of forget about it and so hopefully the next morning or having while you're having your breakfast you can just download all your sort of data and hopefully you know it won't have clouded over or the equipment will have broken down or something like that but nine times out of ten you'll get all this high quality data and then you can start doing all the processing mm. so it's great fun it, again it's not right. an either or situation <laughs> mm -hmm. um, the thing I think once you set up a system like that abroad, it's less enticing to do the same thing at home, not only from right. a sort of financial point of view, but mm -hmm. you know, the sky conditions abroad are so much better. Um, it, so you know, you've got this with uh, Ian King. How do you do you split the time? Is it available to you whenever you want it? Just uh, arrange it yeah. between yourselves? Yeah, that's, right. that's exactly right. What we do is um, we agree on a particular target. And then once the data is downloaded, he takes it and processes it. I'll take right. it and process mm -hmm. it. And again, you know, we do process right. the images slightly differently. So mm -hmm. we start off with this sort of nascent raw data and then we just put our own stamp on it. And that, that's worked perfectly. Um, and just one uh, last the, the question about this remote telescopes. By definition, these are remote locations. I'm assuming that um, you would have a, uh, however remote it is, you still have electrical and telephone connections to that remote location or using some other technology no no that's you're exactly right i mean um, these observatories they're, they're powered you know in the normal way i think the internet can be a little bit more problem problematical 
Um, so, you know, each observatory will vary. Some perhaps may, you know, run off solar power or something. I think Collins uh, Observatory in Spain, I think that's at least partially powered by solar power. And, you know, internet, um, there's, there were no sort of internet cables or anything like that. So I think they use satellite technology for that. So it's all, you know, it all works fine. And, uh, you know, you obviously have to have that. Mm. And, and, and I think you alluded to this earlier on. Um, even though you're in remote site, um, you know, we've heard about the, uh, how upset um, astronomers are, professional astronomers are, with Starlink and their huge mega constellations of satellites which uh, interfere with their observations. What have your personal experiences been with A, these mega constellations and artificial objects in, um, in space, but also with climate change? Have you seen a deterioration in observing conditions over the last decade or so? Yeah, um, without a shadow of a doubt, both of those factors have contributed to degrading the sky conditions. I mean, uh, to give you an example, um, say five years ago, I'd be able to go out to my observatory, set, set the, the, the system to take say, 10 minute exposures, but lots of them, and then you, know, you add them all together. And back then I'd go out there and probably 10% would, um, would be clear of satellite trails. Uh, sorry, 10% would be affected by satellite trails. And right. you know, I'll, you can deal with that, and I'll, I'll talk about that just briefly in a second. But come to now with all the Starlink satellites and all the others that are going up there as well, it's more like probably sort of seventy percent now are affected by some form of satellite trail. There might be a faint one; it might be a really bright one. Now, in the past, if you had those images, you'd probably just throw them away and think, you know, I'll just shoot a few more. But obviously, if, for example, you know, when you've got such a big percentage of them that are affected by satellite trails, you have to um, look to alternative means. Now, fortunately, they can be dealt with reasonably effectively in software. So the idea is when we're stacking all these images, you can use certain procedures that can recognize these trails and they'll remove them from the final stacked image. Mm -hmm. right. That works well. But also, if, if, you, if you, for example, you took a single image and it had a great big air craft trail or multiple satellite trails yeah. there are other software solutions using programs like photoshop and um photo that have got very advanced clone tools that allow you to sort of cosmetically remove the satellite trail so you're not having to throw away these huge chunks of data but you know these these things are affecting our uh, the quality of our images no no that now you know as a, a really keen amateur, I can sort of say oh, it's really bad, but I think it goes much further than that in the fact that these things will be affecting the professional observations, notably the ones that are looking for things like near-Earth asteroids, um, the potent or potentially hazardous asteroids that mm. could have, a, you know, a, well, say an impact on Earth, that's sort of mm -hmm. literally speaking. So whilst it's a, a, an inconvenience for us, I do worry about the bigger picture um, mm. you know, professionals are being affected by these as well. So, you know, more and more of these satellites are going up, but I'm hoping that you know, there might be some sort of mitigating circumstances where the, 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 um, the manufacturers of this equipment will accept that, you know, these are causing a problem and maybe they can do something to sort of reduce the impact of the brightness at least. Mm. And the second part of your question was about the, um, the climate. Yeah. And I think the climate is definitely changing. We're seeing it, um, you know, I've, with, with um, my observatory here, with our shared observatory in Spain, and with my um, remote um, work with Telescope Live, there definitely seems to be a deterioration. There's less clear nights now than we used to have. And I think this year from home, mm -hmm. this is one of the worst years I've ever known in terms of the sheer oh. lack of clear nights. Well, wow. It's been um, a, a terrible year. I'm hoping you know, now the, the nights are drawing in a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's now sort of beginning of September. So, you know, uh, hopefully this the skies will start to sort of clear up a little bit. I think we're definitely seeing a deterioration in um, in sky quality in terms of more cloudy nights. And just on the flip side of that, um, when we uh, went into lockdown here in the UK in March uh, 2020, um, we and, and a lot of the industry and certainly the uh, aviation industry uh, pretty much uh, closed down. Um, did you spot any, were you able to detect any change in the skiing conditions as a direct result of the um, industrial and commercial inactivity forced by the lockdown from here in the UK? I think so. Um, 
I remember last year we had that um, apparition of a fantastic comet called Neo Wise, which was a naked eye mm. comet. It was a gorgeous comet. Yeah. And I was out there, I think it was last July um, of last year. Mm. And um, the sky conditions were lovely. I mean, first and foremost, no aircraft at all. <laughs> uh, you know, we don't get a huge amount over here, but there's enough. Um, it, it was so quiet. And I think the actual uh, light pollution was less as well. You know, we had a very nice run of clear nights last year and um, while the comet was around, thankfully, and I was out there night after night in the early hours and it was just absolutely gorgeous. You could see the Milky Way overhead, oh. the bright planets around across the sky. We had noctilucent cloud displays and the comet itself. So last year, you know, around about that time in, in, the, lock, in, in the first of the sort of big lockdowns, I think there was a notice, noticeable improvement in terms of light pollution. Of course, like the, all the aircraft trails and stuff like it didn't affect satellite trails, but... Um, yeah, I think it did. And, and um, you know, in, in some ways, that was one of the good things about the lockdown. Thank you. And, and you mentioned um, when you were troubled by star trails, you can take out those uh, frames with the, uh, sorry, with the satellite trails, you can take out those uh, frames with the satellites and then just use the rest. That's kind of um, one of the features that uh, is down to modern digital software. And it's not something that's available to, for example, Edwin Hubble when he was using the 100 inch and he'd have a single emulsion for this plate. And even if his exposure was um, hours uh, or multiple hours long, um, it was a single plate. So he couldn't, couldn't possibly have done that. So if you can just summarize or just outline a few um, modern, useful um, software packages that uh, you use perhaps on a regular basis uh, for your image processing. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. I mean, I think there's, there is one software package that's head and shoulders above all the others in terms of image processing. You know, it doesn't control the telescope or anything like that. It's purely a package that's um, uh, for image processing. It's called PixInsight. Um, it's what P-I-X-I-N-S-I-G-H-T. It's all one word, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's it's been around in in various sort of incarnations for about the last fifteen years, I think, and then suddenly it became really popular. And it's a pro program that's evolving all the time, so incredibly powerful. Not the easiest software to learn. It's quite daunting when you first see it. I <laughs> use it quite regularly, and yeah. it, it's really really good. And you know, if you look to all of the sort of the the high end sort of astro images, they'll all sort of be using PixInsight. So that that's great. I think it's about about 250 pounds to buy something like right. that but it's updated mm -hmm. frequently so that, that's what i'd recommend for for that but if you're perhaps um you know just a, a casual um astro imager maybe just using a dslr or something i mean you can do you know pics and site will work with that as well but programs like adobe photoshop and mm -hmm. uh, some a slightly newer program because you know, photoshop's been around a long time called affinity photo mm -hmm. They're almost equal in terms of their, their power for, for doing not only daytime photography modifications, but for astro imaging as well. The difference is, and I think this is quite significant, is with Photoshop, you have to pay a monthly subscription to use it. They've gone over, rather being sort of an expensive package, they've gone out of monthly subscriptions. And it works out about 10 pounds a month, I think, which is, you know, okay. But Affinity have taken a completely different route in the fact that it's a one-off purchase for the software and it's updated regularly as well. But once you bought it, there's no other sort of costs. And amazingly, um, during the, the lockdown, they, they were offering it at half price. Now, its original price is fantastic, but when they had the discount, it was £23.99 pence to buy, which is like preposterously cheap. <laughs> Yet yeah, it's an incredible half high-end um, software package. Now, what's even more exciting is one of the, the people that work for um, Affinity Photo, a guy called James Ritson, is a very, very keen amateur astrophotographer who originally used his own back garden images, but since more recently is, is starting, like me, to use robotic telescope images. Mm -hmm. He's a very, uh, very clever and articulate person, but because of his interest in, in astrophotography, he's managed to incorporate Ah. Uh, features within Affinity Photo, mm -hmm. which um, enable you to use it uh, with CCD cameras and CMOS. So for example, you can do proper stacking 
in, in Affinity, which Photoshop you can't do. So we, again, you couple that with the remarkably cheap price. It's a fully featured program that is evolving all the time, thanks to his input. And, um, you know, I use it all the time. It's a great alternative for people who don't want to invest hundreds of pounds in software. You know, it will do, um, a, not, it's not in the same league as PixInsight in terms of astronomical work, but in some ways it's better because it allows you to do all the cosmetic stuff, which PixInsight isn't so easy to do. So I recommend for people starting out, mm -hmm. check out Affinity Photo. I think it's you can get a free, fully functional download for 30 days or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, have a play with it. Um, yeah. for, the, for the more sort of nerdy people who may be listening, it will allow you to operate directly on 32-bit FITS files without any form of conversion at all. You can do the full processing stream in full 32-bit sort of high, high sort of dynamic range mm. uh, imaging. So. Uh, thanks to James Ritson, it, you know, it's got its foot in both camps now, and it's a perfect software package for people starting out. Is James based in the UK? I think so, yes. Um, I think so, yeah. He, um, he, you know, he's done, if you go onto YouTube and, and search for James Ritson, you'll see right. hundreds of very uh, lucid um, uh, tutorials on on Affinity as a daytime publishing program, you know, for daytime mm -hmm. images. But again, because of his interest in astrophotography, he's got this very useful tutorials on there on, on, on using it for astrophotography as well. Do that. Is he quite young, James Rick? I think so, yeah, I think. Yeah, so, um, so first of all, uh, you're dead right about Affinity Photo. I was one of those who jump, jumped on the bandwagon last year and was able to get it at that lower cost. And I thought because it was so low, I thought, hmm, it won't be all that good. But you, you're dead right. I have used it since then. And um, in addition to being pretty much um, uh, being able to do what Photoshop does, it is able to read Photoshop files. Yes. So if you have some, yeah. if you're used to working Photoshop and you stopped and you've got the PSD files, Affinity Photo will read them, no, no problem. Quite and, uh, happily, uh, yeah. And, and also, I think. What, what helps for people um, if maybe converting over from Photoshop is that so many of the menu layouts are the same. The terminology is the same. So, so glad that you mentioned Affinity because, you know, Photoshop as, I and mean, you know, it is a good product, but it's just so prohibitive. As the fact that when you subscribe, a subscription model is something that I, I'm just not particularly comfortable with. So thank you for A lot for of people would that. agree with that. And so just... Uh, Mm -hmm. One final thought on the two of them is I found that as Photoshop was being updated, it was really slowing down in, in usage. It would take a long time to open. It would take a long time to, you know, to do the, the, the processing on images, a long time to save. Whereas Affinity is like blisteringly fast. It's a hugely responsive program. And you know, I find that really, and to be fair, the later versions of Photoshop do seem to have addressed that sort of latent, latency sort of problem a little bit. And yeah, first got some more more things in it than affinity, but you know. And then finally, on in terms of software for telescope control, are there any ones that stand out for you? Yeah, um, there there are several. And um, if I go back to the the early days, I, I, was, I was using a piece called a piece of software called Maxim DL, which I still mm -hmm. use um, out in the observatory at, at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, there's a program called the Sky X, which is um, it's planetarium software. So it gives you a display of what's in the sky. And if you want to go to a particular target, you just click on it and the telescope will go there. Mm -hmm. But with an additional module, that will also do full control of all of your imaging equipment. So effectively you're using one package to do that. Right. Probably the most popular um, camera control software is Sequence Generator Pro. Right. Because that does allow you to set up scripts, for example, uh, as well as doing all the calibrations and things. But what's really good, is we're starting to see very comprehensive free software becoming available. And um, one of the ones that seems to be most popular is called Nina, N-I-N-A. And I believe from memory that sounds for Night Imaging and Astronomy. Right. An, uh, so <laughs> but again, very, very um, functional, um, very um, popular, completely free. And of course, there's other things like Sharp Cap, which is another sort of popular one. Um, not quite free, but almost. 
So, um, you, know, we, uh, you know, you have to tip your hat to these people that spend so much time developing these programs and then just allowing them to be used completely free of charge by the community. So you've got really sort of, you know, these guys are absolutely fantastic. And, and you know, one of the other um, factors in all this is that the, the generation who's starting out, they've been brought up in the computer age, so they're quite happy with the software, whereas absolutely. people of our age, you know, we, we had to, we had schooling, which is very different. And then we were introduced to computers. Oh, what's that? Then we had to learn all about computers. And so they will uh, just uh, leapfrog that particular step in their uh, learning curve. So just look into the future. Um, you know, we've seen the development of uh, the transition from uh, photographic film emulsion type imaging to electronic CCD and CMOS. And we also talked about the revolution of the amateur astronomy as a hobby from the days of uh, uh, building our own <laughs> and you know we're old enough that we probably did uh, and and then the initially I think the Russian import and then the, now the Chinese imports the equipment's got cheaper and better what do you think as a new innovative in addition to robotic telescopes in the coming let's say decade or so I find it quite difficult to to sort of think into the future because you know for example Five years ago, if you'd have asked me exactly the same question, I wouldn't. I'd have said to you, "Well, I think well, the CCD technology will get better, um, and you know there'll be more sensitive sensors, and you know, general, you know, maybe the cost would come down." But that isn't what happened. You know, with the the CMOS revolution um, and and the kind of demise of the CCD camera, you know, I don't think any of us saw that coming, and I certainly didn't. So in the future, I, I don't know. I mean, if you look in, in the magazines, there, there's new um, technology becoming available almost every week. Mm -hmm. I think maybe the equipment might get cheaper. Um, maybe that the CMOS cameras will become even more sensitive, um, which would be great. Um, you know, it makes our life a lot easier. It makes, makes it easy to get results much more quickly. Um, Filter technology may or may not develop because if people are using these these popular color cameras with specialized filters, you know, maybe the filter technology, uh, you know, will kind of stagnate. I don't know. Um, mount technology. Well, you know, we are seeing different different types of mounts becoming available. And uh, again, with high precision encoder fitted mounts, which, you know, mm -hmm. produce really high quality um, guiding. Um, we're seeing lots of these little star track amounts, which people you know, might take abroad just um, to run off a set of batteries for doing Milky Way photography. You know, maybe they'll sort of improve. Um, it, I, I'd expect more of the same. I think that's as, as much as I, with my sort of take yeah. on things, that's as much <laughs> as I can think about, to be honest, but something, you know, incredible might be around the corner. Mm. I don't know. Well, you know, 20, 30 years ago, um, if I'd asked you about remote telescopes, you so, thought, mm, yeah, but not for the amateurs just yet. So look into your crystal ball, <laughs> so speculation only. Um, you've seen the huge advances in uh, particularly the private space sector. Um, when do you think um, space-borne um, telescope would be available as a remote, um, remote telescope for private individual use? Is there a time period when you think, well, yeah, okay, the kind of um, companies you mentioned, like Telescopes Live, that might be available, but in space. How far away is that, do you think? I think it's quite a while, but I will speak to my friends at Telescope Live. And yeah, they're yeah. Quite proactive, so <laughs> I, maybe I, I, the <laughs> thing, you know, with, with, uh, you know, this, again, you know, 20 years ago or something, if, if you and I were talking as we are now, and we were talking about, the way sort of the space um, the space sector is going, we'd think about the shuttle and stuff like that. And, you know, all of a sudden the shuttle's gone, you know, we yeah. stand to lose the Hubble telescope at some point. Um, and, you know, we're seeing this huge sort of rise of private, so, you know, people like um, SpaceX, you know, Elon Musk and um, the other sort of companies, uh, Blue Origins, I think it's another one. You know, all of a sudden we're seeing these reusable spacecraft, we're seeing the public going up to technically into space yeah. just about um, yeah. and, you know th th there's a lot of momentum there I think so who's to say that maybe someone like Elon Musk would say well okay we've got the technology if there's enough 
uh, people interested, we could put a, a, a small telescope up into orbit. I think you know the technology is is there easily uh, right. to do that, but whether it will, act, you know, whether there is a will to do that sort of thing, but I think that it will come. I'm not quite sure on what time scale, but I think, <laughs> I think it, you know, like it to come, that'd be great. And when it does, we'll have another chat about that then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, couple of a uh, couple of uh, um, final questions now on a different topic. <clears throat> You've been involved in, as I say, communicating. Uh, about astronomy and astrophotography for a long time. You've delivered online courses um, and, um, and, and written books. One of the most recent one was last year. Um, what, um, uh, how was that book? I think it was called Shooting Stars, The New Ultimate Guide to Phot Photographing the Universe. How's that book going and what are you working on now? In well, it, it, as far as I know, it's going very well. Um, the, the, the three books that I've done um, have been um, with my friends at Astronomy Now, and they've been absolutely brilliant, and they give me quite free reign to sort of put the content together for, mm -hmm. for these books. And they're they're designed to help people with all aspects of image processing. So the um, the first sorry when the it's Shooting Stars two. So that that is the third book, but it's Shooting Stars two. Um, when that was released, it was just prior to the lockdown um, starting. So. Mm -hmm. Um, originally, they would have put the books into Smiths and places like that, but I don't think they did with that one. So I don't know how well it's doing. So it's just available online, but you know, right. I think it's doing quite. The others sold out reasonably quickly, right. and of course, the other side of the coin is I'll, I've got copies of the book here, which I'll take to my talks, and if people you know enjoy the talk, they sometimes they buy the book. Of course, that hasn't happened mm -hmm. um, for the last eighteen months because of the lockdown. There's been yeah. no sort of meeting mm -hmm. between people, so. Um, that you know, it, as far as I know, it, it's doing well, and you know, get reasonably good feedback from people who say I bought the book, you know, found it helpful, that sort of thing. So you know, that, that's been great. Do you have copies of all three books at home? And if people wanted to get a copy because they're not getting to see you personally, if they want an autograph copy, they can drop you an email. Well, they they could certainly could for the third book um, because I have got some boxes of them okay. here, as you okay. know, as I explained earlier. About I haven't been able to sort of take them with me to the talks. But the, the, the previous two were actually sold out, but you can right. still pick them up on places like eBay. Right. They're, they're, they're a bit few and far between now. I think people do hang on to them. Right. Yeah. But, you know, it's the sort of thing you can refer back to. And do you have anything in the pipeline in terms of a writing project? Nothing right specifically, but I suspect mm -hmm. what will happen perhaps within the next year will be. Um, Shooting Stars 3. Right. <laughs> sort of running out of titles here. So you know, the, the format sort of worked well. That wasn't my name originally, but I think it works well. So, you know, oh. there's plenty of new material to go in that. Um, for example, um, right at this particular time and for the last few months and for the next few months, I've been doing a series of articles in astronomy now. I write a monthly column, masterclass column for Astronomy Now magazine. And that's evolved into a five-part um, tutorial on removing satellite trails, like you know, as we talked about earlier on, using the, the two techniques, the, the software stacking removal and the more cosmetic removal for people who may be just working with DSLRs or something like that. So that that's you know that's been involved, and that's something like that might end up in a book in the future. Uh, again, over the last couple of years, I've featured Affinity Photo. Because it's such a good alternative for people starting out, did a, a nine-part series in astronomy now on affinity photos. So again, maybe that will be amalgamated into the next book. I'd say it's, they're, they're quite good with what they allow me to do. I so. mean, that, particularly the affinity photo mm. one uh, is um, is something which uh, I'd be interested in. I think, given the um, low-cost starting point, it's um, it would be very attractive to many astronomers. So I would be interested in that too. Um, and then finally, Nick, um, the road between astronomy and music is a well-trodden one. And I'm thinking of uh, Brian Cox, Brian May, even mm -hmm. Patrick Moore, he did a bit. Yeah, and yeah. I didn't know this uh, uh, when we first met, but um, you started off as a, as a drummer in a band, didn't you? You're still doing a bit of that now? Well, I absolutely am, yeah. Um, but unfortunately, the lockdown has pretty <laughs> much curtailed the band I was in the previous because all of a sudden all of the gigs stopped right and a few of the members decided oh you know it, it's been 18 months i don't want to sort of carry on and trying to find replacements and that's been really difficult 
and a lot of the venues we used to play just haven't reopened or they're not open for rock rock bands anymore mm -hmm. but it, it, it definitely appears to be a correlation between um astronomy and music and i think i'll, I'll go so far I'll stick my neck out here and say rock music specifically <laughs> you look, right. look patrick moore but the yeah. people you mentioned earlier on you yeah. know and people like stuart clark um, I don't know if you know Stuart. He's um, oh, a, a very didn't... good. Yeah, he's he's a superb author, right? He, yeah, uh, um, uh, and a superb guitarist as well. Played in the right. band him over the years. So, it, it, so often when I'm out at astronomy conventions or if I'm giving talks, okay. um, you know, in fact, not so long ago, just before the lockdown, I was giving a talk to the Loughton Astronomical Society, and a guy came up to me. He said, uh, "Oh, he said." Nice, nice talk, like the images and all that, but he said, I think we've shared the same taste in music. So it turned out he was a drummer mm -hmm. and we did share exactly the same taste in music. So we've become very good friends since then. And mm -hmm. we're always in contact. He lives over in Hertfordshire, but again, he's a great sort of back garden astro mm -hmm. And we share the same love of sort of high, high, you know, top level drummers and stuff like that, the same sort right. of bands. So I think there is definitely a link between the two. <laughs> So many people have said, yeah, I used to play in a band and this, that. Right. So. so great. Not only come to listen to you speaking about astronomy and, and astro imaging, but uh, listen to some of your gigs. So hopefully we can get that done on the card soon. Um, you mentioned, just in closing, you mentioned right at the beginning that you are now back on the, ro on the road to speaking at uh, Amateur Astronomical Society. Can you just mention those two? I'll, I'll put, include them in my... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm tending not to travel quite so far uh, as um, as I as I used to because you know traveling is quite difficult now. Mm -hmm. um, so fortunately, the, the societies are right. So my first face to face talk is is in uh, next week, next Wednesday, mm -hmm. um, at the uh, North Essex Astronomical mm -hmm. Society. They're, right. they're a very good society. I've known them for donkeys years. I've sort of given them talks many times over the years. Right. And then the next one is on um, the 22nd of September at the Orpington Astronomical Society. Again, um, you know, a very good proactive society. And then um, there's a couple of others coming up, um, one at the Star Astronomical Society and one at the Havering Astronomical Society. So um, right. there's four for the rest of the year and then a few more sort of appearing now for next year. So how they'll actually pan out i don't know um most of them say probably have to still wear face masks except for the speaker and um, they might limit the numbers and um there may not be refreshments and stuff like that but at least we're able to get and meet people and talk to talk and that's that's the best thing the zoom talks have been absolutely great they've been a real lifeline for people like myself and societies to sort of interact um, you know, providing the internet doesn't let, let us down, <laughs> which I'm so far we've been okay. Um, you know, the, the Zoom talks work well and they, they were a great alternative during the lockdown, but it's going to be absolutely awesome to get back to visit, you know, societies again. So Nick Semenek, uh, thank you so much for taking us through the last four decades and the uh, enormous uh, strides that amateur astronomy and astrophotography in particular has taken. Thanks a lot. We appreciate it. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks for, you gave me some great questions. Uh, it's been great to sort of think about those. Uh, so it's been happy to do it any other time in the future.